Okay, Second John. I thought we could get through the whole chapter last week, but no. I think we got through three verses. Can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Don't buy Verizon. No, just kidding. No, I have Verizon. To the elder, or from the elder. Now, last week we were talking about how this was probably, this could have been a letter written to uh, one of two sources, a actual person who he referred to as the elect lady and her children, or his regular children at home, or it could have been written to the church, but because the church was under great persecution, uh, it might have been kind of hidden. But, but as you look at the content, and the context of everything that's written in this letter, you can take it either way. You can have the uh, lady being the church, or you could have the lady being the head of a household, her children being those whom she is raising, some doing well and others not doing so well, or the church having children within the church, some doing well and others not doing well, because that's always the case. The truth of the matter is, is that for all the people that come to Jesus Christ, Many of them will never make it all the way. And the reason why I say this is because a lot of people come to a religious commitment to Jesus Christ, but they never really come to know him as a person. Never come into a real relationship with God. It's always like God's way out there and they're way over here. And when something starts to shake their life and, and that person that is far away is not there to save them, then they, they walk away from the faith. So of the thousands upon thousands of people that I knew 45 plus years ago that accepted the Lord at the same time as I did, and we all came to the Lord by the thousands during the great revival, there's not that many of them still walking with the Lord. In fact, I'm still getting calls from people that got saved back over 45 years ago that are asking to meet with me because they want to renew their faith. They want to know, they want to get close to God again. And some of these people were ministers. There were people that became pastors. There were people that became evangelists. There were people that were some of the people inside the early Christian uh, rock groups in the early days. They are just going, hey, I've lived my whole life as I wanted to, I made money, I bought and sold things, I, I own two or three properties, I have cars, I have wealth, I, you know, I have jewelry for my wife, I've raised my kids, they're all gone through college, and I am empty. And not empty because the nest is empty, they're empty because they didn't refill. They didn't refuel. Just like we know that we have to refuel our cars. It's the same thing in our relationship with God. We have to refuel on a daily basis. If you let it go too long, you might sputter out on the freeway. Have to walk back for gas, so to speak. And it's that way with our Christian walks. People go, I ran out of gas. What am I going to do? What should I do? And I go, well, it's time to refuel. There's no shame in running out of gas as long as you come to refuel. But the last, the, the most horrible thing you can do is just don't do anything. You just sit there and you wait. And I, I believe that everyone who really come, comes to Christ and has the Holy Spirit living in them, they will all go to heaven. I think that God's desire was that all would be saved and come to repentance and be saved. Therefore, everyone who receives him by faith and receives the Holy Spirit, they are saved. But there are saved and there are saved. There are some people who walk with the Lord, people that don't walk with the Lord. The people that don't walk with the Lord could be very well be filled with the Spirit, but they have quenched the Spirit, they have grieved the Spirit, they have hardened their hearts against the Spirit, and therefore they are now in a stale place, or a place of uh, stag stagnicity, if there's such a word. <laughs> I make up my own words. <laughs> I create my own dictionary, my own slang. So this is what John is, is he's speaking to. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to individuals, and you can kind of see both. Last week we were, we were seeing uh, about how he was, he was really emphasizing the truth, the truth, the truth, because of the truth, the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. And then he, he actually started out the letter, and this is where we actually left uh, 
uh, off last week as he said, Grace and mercy and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. So he said, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. It was apparent that John had knowledge concerning the spiritual walks of her children, whether or not it was this woman or whether or not it was the churches there. Some were walking, some were not. And this oftentimes is a sad commentary that in, in families there are those who come and those who don't come to Christ. There are those who come and don't walk with the Lord and those that come that become true disciples. My goal always when I am with people, no matter what level they're on, if they're unsaved, I want them to be saved. If they are saved, I want them to come closer to Christ. If they are ministers, I want them to come closer to Christ. What we, what we are here for in this small little short time span is to build up the body of Christ and to lead souls to Christ by dispensing and dispersing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's an easy task. It sounds hard because it seems like there are so many people that need to be touched. But when you serve a God who is infinite and you realize that he is limitless in his scope and his power and his abilities, then it's not hard at all. And we don't have to do it all. We're not the ones that have to take care of everything. We're not the ones that have to know what to do with everyone and take care of everyone's needs. In fact, one of the hardest lessons you learn when you become a part of ministry, which is to be a servant, is to know who to minister and who not to minister to because so many people need to be ministered to. So many people are in need. And what you find out after a while is that just because there is a need, it doesn't mean that it's your calling to help that need. That's why we need to be close to the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to hear God through the Holy Spirit so we can discern and know if we're supposed to do something and, what, uh, and if we're not supposed to do it. Because I have many friends that are no longer ministers because they have burned out. They burned out because what they, what they saw in scriptures is for me to do this, this, and this. And then in a, almost a religious manner, they try to fulfill those things and they burn out. What you learn is you learn the basics, but then you learn to be sensitive to the Spirit. And as the Spirit leads you to do something, or the Spirit leads you to speak to someone, or minister to someone, or help someone, you take care of that person, and then He supplies everything you need to do what He asks you or calls you to do. But if you take on everything, if you just say, okay, everyone that's hungry, I'm going to feed. Everyone that is naked, I'm going to clothe. Everyone that is not doing well in the Lord, I'm going to counsel. You'll burn out really fast. Sometimes we think that we have to take care of everyone around us that we come in contact with, that it's God's will because we've come into contact with people that we're to take care of these people, and it's not true at all. And so the body is one body. We all have the spirit living within us, and that very same spirit teaches us all things. And also, Jesus said that in, in, that, in whatever time it is that you are called upon, in, I think he was specifically talking about when they are brought before authorities and everything. Don't worry, the spirit who lives in, the spirit will tell you what to say. This is now part of what we are doing as the body of Christ, with the spirit living in us, is that when it comes time for you to know what to say, God will put the words in your mouth if you just believe. But if you are trying to do it yourself and trying to think of the things to say and you've heard something on the radio or you took a school of evangelism somewhere and you fumble around trying to remember your notes and you'll always fail. But the person that doesn't fail is the person who relies completely upon God through the Holy Spirit to do everything that they are supposed to do in the Spirit. Something that has become a stumbling block to ministers today is that a lot of ministers, including a lot of my friends and, and peers, have, have actually forgotten what it was like to rely on the Holy Spirit. They've gotten to a place where everything runs really smoothly because they built their churches or they built their ministries and they have a lot of help and they have a big entourage of people and they have lots of money in the bank and so they don't need God. Or they feel like they don't need God. So they make decisions based on logic, 
They make decisions based on other people's opinions that are trying to be logical. They try to get a brain trust together of people who have really good ideas, and they sit around and have little meetings, and then they decide what to do, and then they go out and do it. And it does accomplish something. Yes, it does. There's something there. But is it of the Spirit? And how do you know if it's of the Spirit? Sometimes it takes a little time to see what the fruit of that ultimately is. And I would dare say today that I don't know a lot of people that follow the Holy Spirit or can discern between people that are of the Spirit and aren't of the Spirit. There's been such a move away from anything supernatural that people can no longer tap into that relationship with God through the Holy Spirit and they can't hear Him. And so what they do is they just go on automatic. You know, they automatically counsel. They have certain verses set aside for people that are going through marital problems. They have certain verses set apart for people that are going through, uh, you know, substance problems and on and on and on. And then they quote these scriptures. And yes, they do do something, but it's not what God has always intended. What he wants us to do is he wants us to be extensions of himself. We are the body of Christ. That means that if we are the body of Christ, then if he is the head, then we are just responding to what he is commanding us to do on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. We can make our plans, but God directs our steps. We can step out to do things, but it's ultimately God that has to lead and guide us in every single aspect of what he sends us out to do. That sounds like a really tall order, but it, it's not complex if you stop trying to do it yourself. If you stop trying to lean to your own understanding about these things. And so John was speaking to this woman and he said, I'm, I'm pleased, I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed that some of the children are still walking in truth. That they're still walking in the spirit as we receive commandment from the Father. And he says, but now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. This was always John's theme. I mean, there are a lot of other aspects of, of God besides love, but love is, the, is, is what keeps the whole thing uh, together. It brings us all together. It bonds us together. It is the force behind our purpose so that if you do everything because of the love that you have for God and the love that you have for the people that you're ministering to, you can never do wrong. No matter what it is, if you're feeding the poor and you have not love, then you might as well not. If you're preaching a great sermon and, and everyone loves you, you're on the radio all over the world, but you don't have love, you're like a clanging symbol to God. You might minister to other people because of your gifts and, and God will, will use it. But that person will stand before the Lord and the Lord will go, hey, what, what do you expect? Okay, I'll clap for you. This is what we have to be careful about, is our, is our hearts, our attitude. Why are we doing what we're doing? And this is why John was such a great example to us. He said, Now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning. This has always been what we have, is our first love with God, and then that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments, this is the commandment as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And he wasn't talking about the Mosaic law and trying to obey the Ten Commandments and taking all the, and all the commandments that were taken from the Ten Commandments to show the righteousness of God. He's talking about loving God and loving one another and all those things, everything that that constitutes and, and illustrates. To prefer one another, to, to uh, give place to another person, to to yield to that person, to be patient with one another, to not be jealous of one another, not cover what another person has, not be jealous of what a person has, but rejoice in the, in, the, in the blessing that happens to other people's lives. These are the things that we have to get back to. Not all the other buildings, not the, the uh, ministry building or, or flag waving or how many people did you bring or how many people did you minister to? All these things are not the important thing. The important thing is, is, is how did you love? How did you love God today? Who did you love today? What did you do with your, your daily life? This is love that we walk according to his commandments. And if we love God, we will obey his commandments. And we do this because 
it pleases God. It keeps us close to God. Not because we're afraid of God. Not because we're afraid if we don't obey God's commandments and if we don't seek out God, that God's going to uh, get tired of us and then take away our, our ticket to the kingdom of heaven. Some people live like that. They go, well, I think I've gone too far. I can't tell you how many Christians have told me, I'm not sure if I'm saved anymore. And I go, well, were, you, were you ever saved? And they go, yes. Well, then I go, then what's your problem? <laughs> if you're saved, you're saved. God, God didn't give you himself and his son and let him die upon the cross for your sins and give you the Holy Spirit so that he could just take it away. But I do know that there are a lot of Christians that act like people that aren't saved. And any one of us can be those people. Any one of us can, can make that, that transition where we're walking with the Lord, we're doing really well with the Lord, we're excited about God, God's moving through us, and then we just get sidetracked or stagnated, and then you start living carnally. Any of us can live carnally because we have this flesh. If we didn't have this flesh, I think it would be more difficult. But because we have this flesh, this flesh has its own desires, the flesh has its own ego thing going, which is part of our mind, that wants to be seen, that wants to be recognized, that wants to be appreciated, uh, that starts to get bitter when you're not appreciated. All those things are in the flesh. But God's told us if we walk in the spirit, we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. We'll just be seeking to please God. And that's what our Christian lives become after a while. It's not, not rules and regulations, not boundaries, but hey, I, I love God because he loved me first and I want to please him. What is pleasing to God and what's not pleasing to God? And then everything becomes simple on a day-by-day -day basis. Does this please God? Am I pleasing to God? If what, if what I am doing is not pleasing to God, why am I doing it? If I'm doing it, you know, then why am I doing this? How far have I walked away from the mainstream of the Spirit of God? This is love that we walk according to His commandments. So people believe that love is a feeling, it's an emotion, and both are true. However, God's love is deeper, and those who love in this deeper type of love or sense will obey his commandments, and they'll obey them naturally. His commandments both prove that we have his love abiding in us or living in us, and also uh, keep us abiding in him. And then John goes on to say in verse 7, he goes, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. And naturally he was talking about those who, who came up with this weird concept that because God is so holy, he could never live in a human body. So that Jesus Christ, if he is God, which many of these people believe he was God, he wasn't really tangible. That if you walked up to him, he would be like a hologram, some sort of a phantom. And John was saying that people that believe this are believing this because of an untruth. It's the untruth of the Antichrist. Now, some people that go, well, why is that such a big deal? If he's, if he's uh, untouchable or touchable, why is that a big deal? It is a big deal because in order for him to have become our advocate, our high priest, he had to be a man. He had to be flesh and blood in order to be that sacrifice for our sins. Otherwise, what did we do? Sacrifice a phantom or a hologram on the, on the cross? It, that doesn't have any type of impact whatsoever. But when, a, when God himself is born into the a womb of a woman, raised like all of us, has to learn how to walk and how to, how to eat and how to talk, and then from the time that he was old enough to really start to think like a normal person, he was constantly being, being talked to by the enemy because he was a spiritual being, constantly being tempted all throughout his life. That's what makes him like us. So he knows and can relate to everything we've gone through. He's fallen down countless times and hit his head, split his lip, cut himself. He has had to uh, be in the midst of, of bullies, uh, perhaps in Galilee or uh, be mocked because of the fact that he was maybe a loner when he was growing up. And he didn't play like the other kids play, would go the way that the rest of the other kids would go. This is the picture you have to begin to see of Jesus, the man. He grew up like all the rest of us, but he was perfect in every way. 
But then there are these deceivers that come and they just go, no, he was just a phantom. He wasn't real. It says in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3, it said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Speaking primarily about this type of argument. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which we have heard was coming and is now already in the world. In 1 John 4, John is referring to the fact that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. He was defending the fact that Jesus Christ is not a spirit, but a, but a human being. And if anyone does not confess that this is true, then it is the spirit of Antichrist. And he says, look to yourselves that you do not lose those things we have worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Things that we have worked for, things that we have laid the foundation upon. Let's not lose those things we have worked for, that we may receive the fullness of everything that God desires to give to us. This seems to be a point, uh, this seems to be point to the idea that we can as Christians be basically sidetracked into other areas which are not in the mainstream of God. You can be going down the mainstream of God where God wants to move the body and somehow or other we get distracted and go off into these stagnant pools. We can allow error to come into our Christian lives. And then this can keep us from living in God's perfect plan for our lives and therefore lose rewards when we stand before God. So all things which are done in Christ much must remain with you. All truth will remain with you, but the works which are not of God will be burned away. This is what I see oftentimes. You know, people ask me about uh, certain groups of, of people or churches, and um, I know a lot of churches that have wonderful worship, and they have wonderful gifts of the Spirit. It's probably a lot like their church at Corinth, where the people are really into the emotional aspects of the Christian walk, and they, they flowed in the Holy Spirit, and they prophesied in the Holy Spirit, they gave words of knowledge and words of wisdom, they uh, prayed for healing, and healing would come about, but they were not holy. How could this be? I've seen it so many times now that I, I, it's, I can't even count the amount of people that I know that have gone that way, where people have tremendous gifting from God, but they themselves are carnal. Have you ever wondered about that when you when you see like a, a, a great Bible teacher or a great evangelist fall from grace? Where, where they have these tremendous ministries and you have heard them countless times. They have ministered to your soul for decades and all of a sudden they, you find out all these things about their private life. Find out that they have some sort of addiction or that they've been having affairs or all these things. And you go, how could this be? It's easy. They are children of the Most High God who began in the Spirit and had the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit are without repentance. Gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And so they have these giftings. They are exercising these giftings, but they themselves have allowed themselves to go off into these stagnant pools. And so the Spirit will keep on working. The Spirit will work even if you're in the flesh. And that's, that's really humbling when you find that out. I was sharing with people all the time how when we first were uh, out on the road evangelizing, the band that I was in, we were an evangelistic team, and sometimes we'd get so mad at each other, we'd be cussing each other out. Cussing with four-letter words before we walked out on the platform, and 300 people would get saved. Don't think that you have to be holy to be used by God. But do know this, that if you're unholy, God will deal with you as a son, as a daughter. That's why you see this. You can see people with great gifting, great teaching abilities, great powers, great uh, you know, uh, abilities to pray for people and see them healed and prophetic gifts, and yet they can still be very carnal. This is where God wants us to be in balance. He wants us to stay in the Word, let the Word convict our hearts, and move in the gifts of the Spirit. So that we have the word of God, we have the foundation of the word of God, and yet we can prophesy, and yet we can give words of knowledge, and yet we can pray for people and see them healed. These are all things that God did in the very beginning. The first church was a very holy church, and they kept each other accountable, mostly because they were being persecuted. Persecution brings holiness, believe it or not. 
because then everything that's external gets stripped away. And all you find yourself doing is staying in communion with God, desperately staying in communion with God, and desperately staying in communication with one another. But in places like Orange County and other places in the, uh, you know, maybe Colorado Springs, some of these meccas of Christianity, people just start to flounder. Some of the weakest Christians are in the highest concentrations of populations of Christians because they get lazy. And there's so much to do, so many other distractions. These distractions are not from God, they're from the enemy. Distracts us. Gets us more into uh, the the things of our, our temporal life. You know, what, what do we want? How do we want our bodies to look? What color should my hair be? How long should it be? Should it be curly or straight? All the stuff that we, we go through and we spend our money and time on, and God is going, there is a world out there that's dying, and you have the antidote to their to their malady, and we, we do nothing because we're busy being busy. And we're busy consuming. And we're busy get, getting rid of the things we've consumed the next year. It goes on and on and on. But all truth will remain with you, but works which are not of God will be burned away. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation, your Christian foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will be manifest. The day, the day of the Lord will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. So if someone doesn't believe that Jesus is coming, they don't believe in the doctrine of the Father and the Son, someone comes to you teaching a false doctrine, John says, don't receive them into your house. Or Paul said, actually, don't receive them into your house, nor should you even say hello or goodbye or God bless you. This could be really difficult because we want to just be liked by everyone and accepted by everyone. But there's a time where you just don't, you have to show people that they have walked too far over the line. Or you have to show people that they haven't come across. And it's not by not loving them or caring about them or, or being there for them. But you, we, you can't let people think everything's okay if it's not okay. On Wednesday nights, there's a friend of mine that comes to uh, the study. His name is Gordon McLennan. He's a I met him through the, the late artist Rick Griffin, who did a lot of uh, album covers back in the uh, secular days and did Christian album covers, and, and including uh, two or three for me. But he's, he's this unusual guy who ministers to people that nobody else would talk to. And someone will come to him and go, you know, lay out this whole thing on how they live and, 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 uh, and, and talk about the love of God and say, okay, isn't that okay? And, and Gordon will say, no, it's not okay. It's not okay that you do that. The Bible says it's not okay. And if you keep going this way, you're going to be destroyed. But yes, God does love you. And this is the way that we have to be now. We have to be willing to lose the affection. We have to be willing to, to even put ourselves in danger sometimes in speaking the truth in love and tell people what's really true. Because if we just hold back because we don't want to hurt their feelings or we don't want to be disliked or we don't want to lose our friendship, we don't want to lose our jobs or we don't want to lose a promotion, then you're loving that more than you love God. Because God loves them enough to do anything for them and he wants us to love them in that very same way because it's the very same love and the very same purpose. But he was referring to those who come as teachers or prophets or other leaders in the Christian churches. When someone comes to you teaching error and you allow that person the same honor as you would one who teaches the truth, then you are endorsing that person. Yes, be kind. Yes, be loving. But don't endorse them by receiving them into your house. Don't endorse them by letting them have your, your a position of authority. Don't endorse them by, by putting them up on a pulpit. And I see a lot of this going on today. 
I've contested some of my friends and I go, why are you doing this? And they go, because it benefits our ministry. And I go, but what does it do for God's reputation? What does it do for our Lord's reputation? This is going to backfire on you. I promise you it's going to backfire on you. And they'll, they'll, they'll just go, well, I'm going to just do this anyway. And Ten years later, boy. It's like they're doing everything they can to sweep it under the carpet. Don't bless them. Verse 11 says, For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So he's either talking about an actual person or another sister church. We take it either way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word that we can stand upon and it shall never shake. Everything else will pass away, but your word shall never pass away. Your word is always true. Your word always reflects you in your heart, what you feel and what you think about all things. And even in that day when you are revealed, Lord, and, and we see you as you are and we will be with, like you, we know that your, you, the word, will always live fresh in our hearts. And the words that we speak and the words that we, we <clears throat> communicate with will be your words will be pure and bring purity all that comes from you is pure and peaceable gentle easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruit and without hypocrisy and Lord we just pray Lord that you would just put your words within our hearts and let them live that we might be able to be indestructible in these times of, of great confusion and great apostasy in Jesus' name we pray.